Hello everyone and welcome back. This video is going to be a bit of a departure from the previous Introduction to Windows Forensics and Introduction to Memory Forensics series. This is the start of a new series that will concentrate on malware analysis. Don't worry, the other two series aren't going anywhere. Here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to look at a very basic Windows binary that displays a simple dialog box with an OK button and nothing more. It's basically a Hello World app. Next, we'll look at another copy of the same binary that was packed with one of the most ubiquitous packers available, UPX. We'll compare the two files in IDA Pro and note the major differences. Lastly, we'll pretend that the packed binary is malware, which of course it isn't, and we'll perform a dynamic analysis on that file using x64 debug with the goal of allowing the code to execute until the binary unpacks itself in memory. Once unpacked, we'll look at the differences and explore how we can dump that binary to disk for further analysis. This is a real world scenario that is often performed in malware analysis. Of course, we're starting with an unpacked version of the pretend malware to begin with, whereas in reality, we may only have the packed malware. In such cases, we'd likely want to extract the unpacked version of the executable so that we could better analyze it. So let's get started. Packing an executable will compress the contents along with the necessary code to decompress it in a single file. Malware authors will often use this technique as a means of obfuscating their code and making analysis far more difficult than that of an unpacked binary. However, not all packed code should be considered malicious. For example, many authors use packing as a means of protecting their intellectual property. The ultimate packer for executables, known simply as UPX, is one of the most widespread packers currently in existence. It's unique in the fact that it's one of the few packers that actually has unpacking capabilities built in. However, you'll often see that malware authors will rename sections within the binary or change other arbitrary data to break the unpacking functionality as a means of, you guessed it, making our jobs as analysts more difficult. In our example, I'm using the default binary file from iNetSim, which is served up to anything that attempts to download a file from an iNetSim listener. By the way, iNetSim is an awesome utility that simulates internet services such as HTTP, HTTPS, SMTP, POP3, DNS, and more. It's a powerful piece of software that allows us to perform behavioral code analysis in an isolated environment and probably deserves a video of its own. However, none of that matters for this video, as I just wanted to find a simple piece of code that we could use in our lab. So as you can see here, I've got the file properties for these two different sample underscore GUI.exe files. The one on the left here is not packed, and the one on the right is packed. You can see that the difference is 24K for the unpacked version, and about 10K for the packed version, so significantly smaller. When I run either one of them, we see this simple dialog box that says iNetSim, and then this is the iNetSim default binary. Clicking OK simply makes the program exit. That's it. It serves no practical purpose whatsoever. But next, what we'll do is fire up both of these in IDA and actually take a look at the differences between them. Okay, first let's take a look at the unpacked version of the code in IDA. By the way, I'm using the very newest free version of IDA, which is now called IDA Freeware, and it's based on version 7 of the software, unlike the previous free version, which was based on version 5. This was just released in February of 2018, so if you haven't yet taken a look at this, you may want to do so. It's pretty awesome that they provide a free version based on the current release version. It does say that this only works with 64-bit code on their website, but in my experience it works fine with 32-bit code as well, and in fact the binary that we're analyzing is 32-bit code. Let's go ahead and open this up. On the left side you'll immediately see our functions, of which there are many. Let's take a look at the imports, and those of you familiar with reverse engineering will know that we often look at our imports to gauge a piece of software's functionality. For example, there may be specific APIs that are, let's call them high risk or associated with things like process hollowing. For example, if we saw create process and NT unmap view of section or ZW unmap view of section or 
Virtual Alloc EX, or Resume Thread, those may be indications that the software has the capability to do something malicious. In this case, of course, this is not a malicious piece of software. We're just pretending that it is. But the whole point here is that we do see quite a few Windows APIs being called, even for this very simple piece of software. Now, of course, also note that just because we may not see any risky APIs being referenced in the import table does not mean that the program couldn't call them during runtime, but that's a topic for another video. Let's also go up to View, Open Subviews, and take a look at the strings that we see here. And we see quite a few, most notably inetsim, and this is the inetsim default binary, which is the text that we see when we run the piece of software. So now let's compare this to the packed version of the software. So I'll go ahead and close this and we won't save the database. Now let's grab the packed version and open it. And immediately we get a warning that says the import segment seems to be destroyed. This may mean that the file was packed or otherwise modified in order to make it more difficult to analyze. That is exactly what's happened here. You'll immediately note that the functions that we previously saw are all gone. All we see is start. You'll also notice the section name, UPX1, which is a clear indication that this was packed with UPX, most likely. Let's take a look at our imports. Notice there are quite a few missing based on the unpacked version of the code. We don't see nearly as many here. Now let's go ahead and go to open subviews and look at the strings and we see two, whereas before we saw quite a few strings, including the strings associated with the actual program when we launched it. So clearly there is a big difference in just looking at a cursory view of what we see when we open the packed version in IDA versus the unpacked version. So you can see how this would certainly make it more difficult to analyze the packed version of the code. Next, we'll take a look at this code in a debugger. We're going to be using x64 debug, and actually we're going to be using the 32-bit version of that, which is called x32 debug, even though the actual software is still called x64 debug. It's kind of confusing, but you'll see it here on the desktop, and in the next and last section of the video, we'll take a look at that. Okay, now the fun part. Let's take a look at this code in a debugger. Now, before doing this, we would want to ensure that address space layout randomization, or ASLR, is disabled. That's already the case for both of these binaries, but if it wasn't, we could use a tool like CFF Explorer to go ahead and turn that off. Let's take a look at the packed version of the file. On the left side, we'll click on optional header and scroll down to DLL characteristics and we'll click here. You'll notice an option called DLL can move, which is presently unchecked. That's an indication that ASLR is currently off. If that were checked, that would mean ASLR was enabled. First, let's go ahead and open the unpacked code in the debugger. When we do this, you'll notice at the bottom left that we are paused at the entry breakpoint. And you can see that instruction is push EBP. This is indeed the entry point of the code. And if I click run, you'll notice the code executes and we get the result we expect. If I click OK, it exits. So remember the push EBP here because this will become important in just a moment. Let's minimize this and now let's take a look at the packed version of the code. In the packed version, we're again paused at the entry point. But notice that the instruction is not push EBP, it's push AL. So in this case, this is not the original entry point. In the packed version of the code that we're looking at, this is actually the start of the code that will unpack this binary in memory. So in other words, this is the start of the unpacking code, not the start of the original code. That would be called the OEP, or original entry point, and we need to find that. In order to do that with UPX, fortunately, it's fairly easy because what we're going to do is look for a series of zeros. When we see these zeros, what we'll do is we'll scroll up from there and find the nearest jump. 
at the beginning of that sequence of zeros. And in this case, it's right here. There's a pretty good chance that that jump will take us to the OEP or original entry point, which is exactly what we're trying to find. So I'm going to press F2 here to set a breakpoint. And now we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see that we're paused at that breakpoint. EIP or the next instruction to be executed is pointing here. Now let's single step one instruction with F7. When I do so, you'll notice we're at push EBP, which corresponds to the unpacked version of the code. So we have now found the original entry point of the code. At this point, the code has been unpacked in memory and we would be able to find our strings and other things that were obfuscated from us initially. So we don't even have to take it further than this. We can now perform our analysis, but we are going to go one step further and attempt to actually dump this file to disk so that we can perform further analysis. Now, your mileage may vary. This doesn't always work. And in fact, you can often have pieces of malware that you attempt to extract from memory that just simply don't execute properly. And there are many things you have to do to go in and fix that executable so that it will run. In our case, we're going to give it a shot by using a plugin called Ollidump EX. So if I use this plugin, the first thing we're going to do is click the option Get EIP as OEP. So EIP, or the next instruction to be executed, is currently pointing at 0040101D. So we believe that to be the original entry point of the code. We'll choose the Get EIP as OEP option and now we'll go ahead and dump the process. You'll notice it appends the underscore dump to the file name. So I'll go ahead and save this and click finish. And now our process has been dumped. And here it is. So the question is, are we done? Will this run? Well, no, it won't. As you can see here, we get an error. The reason why is because the import address table has been completely destroyed as part of this and we need to fix it. Fortunately, there is a plugin that can help us with that, and it's called Scylla. So if we use this plugin, we can actually click the IAT auto search button, and you'll notice it actually does say IAT found. Now let's click get imports. We see two green check marks here, and it looks like it has been able to reconstruct the IAT for us. Now, oftentimes when you're looking at malware or other code you're trying to extract from memory, you'll have red X's here, indicating that the IAT was unable to be reconstructed, in which case you can go ahead and dump it, but it's probably not going to work correctly, and you're going to have to go in and try to correct that. That's a topic for a more advanced video, certainly outside of the scope of this video. But in our case, we're fortunate because we see two green checks, so that's a good sign. So let's go ahead and choose fix dump, because we already have a dump that we used with Dump EX. Now we just need to fix that dump. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's point it at the dump file here. And you can see that at the bottom, it says import rebuild success. And it's appended underscore SCY to the file name. And if we look, we'll find that right here. Now the question is, will this run? Well, Kind of. The program actually does run, but what's happened to our text here and here? It's gone. Yet the program executes without any kind of error, and if I click OK, it exits as it's supposed to. We'll repeat that again, and again, no strings. So it seems to be somewhat functional. So again, the question would be, why isn't it behaving exactly like we think? The interesting thing is the strings are present. But if we set a breakpoint here, we would notice that it's actually not calling this particular function within the code that populates that text, the title bar text and the text within the dialog box. And we would have to go through and determine exactly why. Now again, this process can be repeated 100 different times for 100 different pieces of malware and you may get 100 different results. Sometimes it works without issue. Sometimes it kind of works, as we see in this example, and sometimes it just doesn't work at all. So in a lot of cases, it's trial and error. We'll have to experiment and 
try to fix the IAT and try to make sure that we have set the OEP correctly. But this is the process I wanted to show you because this is a real world scenario that we often use when we're analyzing malware. So to recap, we have started with an unpacked version of this pretend malicious executable, which of course is normally not the case. We would only have the packed version. So I took this unpacked version, I packed it with UPX. We took a look at it in IDA and we compared the packed and the unpacked versions and we could clearly see that it would be far more difficult to analyze the packed version of the code. Then we went ahead and fired up both in X32 debug. And again, we saw that the 32-bit unpacked version of the code looked exactly as we expected and the original entry point was where we started. But then in the other version that was packed, the entry point was not the original entry point, rather it was the entry point of the unpacking code. And what we had to do was actually find that original entry point, which again, with UPX is fairly easy because we can just look for that long sequence of zeros and go up from there to find the nearest jump instruction, which generally points to our original execution. So that's exactly what we did. And then from there, we could perform our analysis, but we went ahead and we used the Ollidump EX plugin to dump the process. And then we used Scylla to fix the destroyed import address table. And then we had a somewhat runnable executable. And if this were malware, there would be a good chance, for example, that we could then execute that malware in our lab environment and perform behavioral analysis. We could even use the INET SIM tool that I mentioned in the beginning of the video and see if the malware were making calls to uh, different resources on the internet or attempting to download files or various DNS queries. We could perform all kinds of different behavioral analysis using that. So again, I hope you've enjoyed this first look at the malware analysis series. I'm certainly planning many more videos in this series as time goes on. And of course, we'll continue with the Windows Forensics and Memory Forensics series as well. As always, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this. Please do like, subscribe, and share as always. And you may also consider supporting this channel on Patreon if you have an additional one or two dollars a month to spare. Again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.